Hi and welcome back to the show. My name is Mark Roost, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. Not so long ago, I was listening to London Real podcast when suddenly I heard a guest that really grabbed my attention, Philip McKernan. What came up for me was a man that was speaking his truth and wasn't afraid of sharing his vulnerability, his wounds, his warts and all. And when I come across someone like that, I immediately want to get them on my show. So usually I would just get them on my podcast, which you can download on iTunes, SoundCloud and so forth. But this time I decided to record a conversation so I could share it with you. Of course, as we're thousands of miles apart, this is the only way that I could make this happen without having Philip actually in my living room. Now, before I begin this interview, I just wanted to mention something. At what point during this interview, Philip mentions that he would love to see his one last tour concept spread around the world. If you'd like to get involved, get in touch with Philip McKernan's team over on their website, philipmckernan.com. You'll have all the links and information below this video. If you enjoy what you hear today, make sure to share it with one of your friends, subscribe to this channel, and you can go over on iTunes if you wish and subscribe to the podcast. Thanks so much for your time. Now enjoy the interview. Philip, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, really excited to having you. Um, I was trying to think about how I came across your name, and it, and and I was listening to a podcast on London Real with Brian Rose, and I remember being on the on the tube and kind of listening to you and going, "This is refreshingly genuine and honest," and I need to speak to this guy. And I think we interacted on Twitter or something like that, and here we are today. So thank you. I appreciate you appreciate yeah. you having me. I've got a, a very serious question to start off with, which I think everyone listening to this is asking themselves. Do you own any piece of clothing that isn't black? Um, <laughs> let me just check. Well, my underwear today is kind of red and black. Uh, yes, I do, but not a lot. The reason being is every picture I've seen of you, every video I've come across, you're, all, like, you're black. I mean, it's just stable, like color, like shirt. You look great in black, by the way. Um, but it was just something I was wondering, like, is there a secret, like, pink or red T-shirt somewhere in, in Philip's closet? No, there is. And actually, you know, years ago, it was funny, many, many years ago, which is kind of a, a little, I don't know why I'm sharing this, but it's just come up. But years ago, I remember uh, showing off my first, the first pink shirt I ever wore. And I'm wearing it in, in a pub in Ireland, which, you know, <laughs> you know, this is, we're not talking about two years ago or four years ago. We're talking like 15 years ago. Right. And I remember my friends just like, are you kidding me? Are you actually like, do I have to sit beside you with that? <laughs> anyway, fast forward about two hours later, this girl walks up to me and she walks straight up and she wasn't looking for a drink. She wasn't trying to buy me a drink. She wasn't, she just walked up and said, brilliant. She said, <laughs> and I said, what? She goes, a guy willing to wear a pink shirt in public. Good for you. Right. And all my friends are like, so um, where did you get that shirt anyway? And um, so I, I've never kind of followed any kind of code around dress. Um, yeah, I'm not sure black is is whether it's perceived to be uh, the best color to wear on stage or sure. in public or wherever. I just feel good in it. And yeah. it makes me feel very grounded and confident. And that's, that's the purpose behind it. Yeah. One question I had for you, which... Um I think a lot of people who kind of listen to guests and look at other people out there think, oh, yeah, but they've always been like that. You know, they've always been confident that way. They've always had this gift of the gab of storytelling and so forth. I make up it wasn't always the case for you. Totally. Um, I mean, I spoke on stage uh, in Toronto recently, actually just last week, and there was thousands of people in the audience. And I decided to start in the audience, uh, mm. like literally seated in the audience, right. uh, much to the it kind of freaked a few people out sitting around who <laughs> were familiar with me and certainly freaked out the audience when the MC introduced me, walked off the stage and there was no Philip McKernan. Right. And then I started speaking from sitting down and, yeah. and it wasn't to be theatrical. I wasn't trying to be funny. I wasn't trying to stand out. What I was trying to do is emphasize that it was very, it wasn't very long ago that I was sitting in an audience like that, looking at the stage and looking at Robin Sharma, who were all in this lineup, Seth Godin, looking at Gary Vaynerchuk, looking at all these, you know, big names now in terms of uh, speakers saying, yeah, but they're special. Sure. They've got something that I don't have. Mm -hmm. They're, they're unique. Um, I couldn't possibly be like them. And the reality is I'm, I'm not necessarily like them, but it didn't mean I couldn't find my own uniqueness, my own gift, and start to really kind of cultivate that. And mm. um, what people are shocked to hear is that when I got on that stage, I want to puke. <laughs> 15 years ago, when I got on a best man's stage where it all started, outside I want to of puke. Dublin, right? It was that outside of Dublin. It was that your best. Just outside of Dublin, best man yeah. speech. Yeah. 
it's never changed. Um, yeah. And I think that it's got somewhat better, but I think because I constantly push the gauntlet, I'm, I'm, I've never done the same keynote twice. Mm. I'm constantly trying to reinvent, not reinvent myself, but deepen the message so I'm not complacent, I'm not comfortable, I'm constantly trying to push it. And that's why I think the nervousness comes, which is healthy. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that I often find interesting in, in this um, show, I guess, is that we get to speak with people who've you know, achieved a certain something in whatever they're doing, interesting project or, or, or like you doing public speaking and you've got amazing projects we'll talk about. Um, but what I always find fascinating is trying to actually show people that nothing's linear. It's not a linear process. And I, it was, I didn't find that much information about you, I've got to be honest, as I was looking like sort of the background. Uh, but it sounds like you were involved in wine, you were involved with coffee, real estate, and that you once caddied for the president of Ireland. Yes, correct. <laughs> yeah. So how did you go from wine, coffee, houses to people? You mean that doesn't all just make sense to you? I just <laughs> yeah, thought that's that obvious. Make, yeah, like, <laughs> you having wine, um, drink coffee. Yeah. I find myself in the most bizarre, serendipitous situations. And I, and I would have to say that I'd love to take full responsibility for it. And in a way, I'll, I'll take a, a degree of it. I think when you let go of the needing to know, like having everything planned, mm. you trust your intuition a bit more and you say yes a bit more than perhaps. The world has now turned into a place to saying, you know, you need to say no more often because that's the answer to everything because it'll free up your time. I, and, and I say, say yes to everything that feels right. Not that everything that makes sense, sure. not everything that is intellectually uh, viable. Say yes to shit that just feels right. And you'll find yourself caddying for the president of Ireland <laughs> You'll find yourself standing on a stage next to speakers you once had on a pedestal, and wrongly so in my case. In fact, when I walked off that stage the other day, I got tipped on the shoulder by, um, by a lady who said one of the speakers wants to meet you, and he was one of the keynote speakers and the top speakers there. I walk into this man who I've watched on stage for 20 years, and he just said, and, and, and I'm, I'm not boasting here. This is his words. He said, that was outstanding. He said, I've seen a lot of speakers, and he said, that was stunning. Mm. And he said, so stunning. He said, I want you to come to Zurich. I want to fly you to Zurich to speak at my event. And this is a guy that honestly, 10 years ago, I would have looked up at and said, I I'll never be anything remotely yeah. like him. I'm not even capable of what he's capable of. But I find myself in these continuous situations of just not following opportunities and chasing opportunities, but being open in life to possibilities. Yeah. Um, so that's my answer to that. And just following my gut um, and making decisions based on people rather than product, yeah. people rather than, pos you know, you know, um, profit and just following great people. And I think when you follow great people, I think there's a there's the outside chance, an outside possibility. You might even become great yourself. Who knows? But that's not for me or people to self self identify in the context of their own journeys. Right. And yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's fascinating that you say that because um as I was reading, I read somewhere that you said, you know, you'd been stuck for 37 years or you, you were stuck for 37 years. And then four years ago, something you pulled the trigger. I think you used an expression like that. I don't know how many years it was, but pull the trigger. What was it? So, you know, this is the thing I'm trying to like dig at, which is like, what was the, was there a specific moment or was there a, um, an event where you kind of realized that the more you spoke your truth, the more it resonated with people and the more that was actually one of your gifts that you could share with the world? Yeah, I think one of the challenges, just on a, on a slight note, on a, on a, by the way, is, is like when you start to speak your truth, the people who disagree with you and then judge you tend to be the most vocal at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And other people are just sitting back, kind of maybe sitting with the truth and, and maybe absorbing it. And other people are quick to, 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 to criticize. So as you start to speak your truth, the world might appear to reject it. They might appear to judge it. They may appear to be pushing back, mm -hmm. which is all partly true. True, but do you have the courage to continue to put one foot in front of the other, continue to do two things? Number one is to continue to always uncover your own truth. A lot of speakers and people in teaching roles and stuff like that almost get to a point sometimes that they feel they're beyond teach, they're beyond learning themselves, they're beyond uncovering themselves. Hmm. They have all the answers, and that's when we start to get complacent, they start to lose themselves in the work. And then secondly, as that truth emerges, do you have the courage to speak it, to share it with the world? Um so, t so to me, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, the best man speech is a, cl a classic example mm. of, you know, speak speaking my truth and getting a standing ovation and being absolutely mortified to death because I didn't feel I deserved it. Um, 
getting on stage and 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 you know walking to a real estate conference one day in Toronto many years ago in front of 400 people and saying hey who's passionate about real estate and every hand in the wor- in, in the room goes up and I said you're not yeah um you you, you couldn't be I mean yeah. because basically what you're saying is and this was let's say this is a brick you're saying this is what you're passionate about right you're passionate about and you're moved by other things when it comes to people and movement and helping people and helping people connect and stuff like that real estate might just be a vehicle for that so it's it's helping people g- through the lens of my own journey, my own truth, my own work that I do with clients, mm. helping them face their truth. But here's the thing. Most people don't want to face their truth because their truth sometimes is ugly. It's unattractive. They don't want to face the reality that they're living in the wrong city, in the wrong relationship, in the wrong partnership, in the wrong business, or in the wrong job. And maybe that they're in the, in the body of something that they don't really like. So a lot of people get very defensive when you get close to zoning in on a part of them that they right. do not want to see well there's something I, I was i came across someone that said about your speaking style that you point out things that people think that no one else sees and that you kind of you bring that up to the surface and that you kind of mentioned that why is it and i know this is a bit of a big question but why is it that you think people are so attached to hiding behind layers of masks which prevents them from really connecting to who they really are and what they really want well, I think if I'm, I'm just making this up, sure. if I'm a restaurant owner and um, let's just say my destiny, my soul's purpose, whatever you want to call it, my gift is actually doing something completely different. I'll hold on to that as a part of, well, there's two things. One is it's become part of my identity. So if someone says at a dinner party, who are you, what do you, you know, who are you? Oh, I'm a chef or I'm a business owner or whatever. Mm. So we've lost a lot of who we are and what we do, which is an identity crisis sure. the world is facing today. So when you, when you ask a question, people take it as a, you're threatening them. And that's more about them with respect than me. People say I'm intimidating. And I used to think that I was intimidating and maybe I can be, but actually, I'm not intimidating right. because like of because, me. Yeah, because if people feel uncomfortable around what you're saying, it's because actually they're close to something that's needed to be seen. 100%. Yeah. They're afraid of themselves. Yeah. So one is you're, you're threatening their identity. So they don't want that. And when you threaten somebody's identity, they shut down, they get defensive. The other thing is that, let's just say my restaurant fails. Mm. Well, I? I failed doing something that wasn't my soul's purpose. Mm. It was, it was, it was good. It wasn't really for me, but, it, but if I, there he goes again, he's t- I can't believe you do this. <laughs> fun, drink a glass of wine. I'm you're so, you're I, a sadistic bastard. I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> no, you're not, you liar. Um, not. I, I, if, if someone fails at doing something that's not in alignment with them, mm. then it's kind of something that was outside of their control. It was economics. It was whatever. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to face their truth. We, we're so obsessed in this world by what people think about us. Like really obsessed. Mm. And we put a great foot forward on Facebook every day, pretending how happy we are on Facebook typically. And that sounds like a judgment and it's not, it's an observation. I do it myself. I've done it myself to a lesser extent now, I think. Sure. So if, 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 if we're concerned by what people think, the last thing we want to do is to be seen for who we really are. And yet that is the gateway to freedom. Mm. To remove that last mask, put it down and say, hey world, this is me. Mm. Um, we don't want to be seen. We don't want necessarily to find the very thing that we're on this planet to do. Because if we fail at that, then we're really screwed because there's nothing else. Right. And do you, do you think it's almost like we're almost um, geared towards that kind of social acceptance around because of our ancestors around if you weren't part of a tribe, if you weren't part of you know the 150 plus people that you would have been in a community, then you're on your own. And if you're on your own, then it's really difficult to survive. And therefore now today, still, we have this uh, desire to want to fit in and we have this desire to be accepted and to be loved and to be seen. And we're willing to sacrifice ourselves in that process to be able to stay put. Is that something? I I agree with that. I I do agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I I am a big advocate of this, you know, being an individual in this world as well, is that finding comfort in our own skin. So being a part of a community, being part of a tribe, being part of a clan, being part of a family, being part of a company, being part of a business, being part of a movement Mm. is advantageous. And it's an extra, it it, it just, it brings more meaning to my life, but I don't need it. Mm. The amount of relationships, like just bring this back to say couples. I love couples conversations. Yeah, yeah. A lot of couples don't want to work on themselves for whatever reason because they don't feel they, they need to. They don't want to uh, admit that they've got challenges. Sure. And sometimes they're unaware. Yeah. And now scientifically... And what, and what if you find something that we didn't want to talk about that we were fine, but then suddenly you just stirred some shit up and now all of this gunk has come out? 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, face it today or it'll haunt you tomorrow. That's my view. Right. And, yeah. and it's now scientifically been proven, by the way, that uh, couples wait five years too late to yeah. work on the relationship. And people think that they need to hit a crisis before they build their business or work in their business, before they work in themselves. My view is be more proactive in the process. So a hairline crack today will be a, a Grand Canyon in the future. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in terms of you're both looking across sure. each other saying, who the hell are you? Yeah. So we're coming back down to this, you know, real identity crisis. Mm. And there's so many people in the world today that we're, we're in this state of control. Mm. We're so, there's so many people that are so deeply insecure in their own skin. And we feel that I need to be in love. I need a relationship to make myself happy. And the reality is that even if you find someone that looks everything about them, all the check marks, they look perfect. Okay. They cannot make you happy. And it's so unfair to expect them to. And they'll never live up to the expectation and the pressure that you put on their shoulders because you're not happy in your own skin. And that's the part of this journey that most of us are never really fully addressing is that if I can fall in love with who I am, respect who I am, like who I am, um, then everything else is a but, bonus. But isn't that funny though? And there's two things I want to speak to that. The first one is I've heard, I heard you talk about, um, and, I, and I thought that was a really interesting concept that you said, I don't need my wife. Four years ago, I let go of her. I don't mean let go of her like broke up with her, but like emotionally let go of her, the control of needing to be with her. And instead, I choose her. She's not my better yes. half because that would mean that if I lose her, I lose the half and that's the better one. <laughs> it's the best of my half. Yeah. I'm whole, she's whole. We come together in, in a conscious you know, choice as opposed to like, if you leave me, I'm going to die. Or I, I, who am I if you leave me? And that bridges me to the second point, which is, isn't that funny how like we think that by seeking things like crash diets, working out, high sensations, drugs, booze, food, whatever you want to call sex, it's actually in an attempt to fill the void of our lack of self-worth and lack of self-love. Totally. And it's interesting that a lot of people make assumptions that the well-known speakers, the celebrities in this world, yeah. the famous people, the models, the athletes, yeah. they've got their shit yeah. figured out. And how mistaken, how yeah. wrong they are. I have a lot of very high profile people, most of which would do, I would do wonders for my business if I shared who they were, but I don't. I'm sure. very private about who I work with. Yeah. Uh, I had a gentleman on the phone yesterday who was you know, pretty high in the public domain. And I just said, just so you know, no one will ever know we even spoke unless you choose to share it. Um, but they all suffer from the same challenges that somebody who's at the bottom of the ladder, and I say the bottom of the ladder, that they think they're in the bottom of the ladder. I don't believe yeah, they are. Like the Societally, floor, economically, financially, they feel, they feel that they're the ones that are fucked up. And the yeah. guys at the top of the chain are the ones that have it all figured out. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're so mistaken. But here's the problem. Mm -hmm. They then often, we then chase the aesthetics of what this person has. In other words, the intellectual goals. Like, I want to have their wealth. Yeah. I want to have their the fame. I want to have all their yeah. businesses. Because then I will then have what they have and then I'll be happier. Yeah. But they don't live with these people. They don't look at them in the eye when they're lying awake at night with lack of peace of mind. Mm. They don't know that these people aren't, don't have as much meaning sometimes in their life than they sometimes allow people to think. Um, yeah. So I think actually in celebrities have, I believe, this wonderful um, – Invitation. I think that I don't think it's I don't think it's a responsibility, but I think it's an invitation to say, hey, maybe Wayne Rooney, for example, who my my little son looks up to, maybe Wayne should should turn around someday and do a tweet that is is more in alignment with his core, like true, maybe a, a darkness in his life. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, you know, and, and, it, and it's not to expose them and take them off the pedestal. I think what will happen is people will respect yeah. them more. Yeah. They'll see them as humans as opposed to gods. Well, look at Muhammad Ali. When in the 96 in the, uh, you know, Atlanta Olympic Games, for the first time, we saw Muhammad Ali um, shaking and being really vulnerable. And they often say that that was the moment where the public related to him in a whole different new level because they could go, he's human. You know, um, he, he, he also bleeds. Um, and, I, and I think what I love about what you're saying is this idea that we're so afraid to show that you know, we're so afraid to show that. And you talked about football. Still to this day, they haven't had an openly gay footballer come out while being an active footballer in the Premier League, you know, because they're just so afraid. And I remember, I forgot who it was, uh, Gary something, not Vaynerchuk. Gary Southgate, was it? I forgot what his name. No, someone said, I believe that the first person who will ever do this will, will, will become one of the most sort of well-respected footballers and get attention and what, whatever you want to call it because of the authenticity. 
again, I'm, I'm going to drive it back again to this question to you, which is like, because I'm fascinated by this, right? To try and understand why is it that we are, what are we so scared of? Like what, what, like what, what do you go through and what do you see that people are so afraid of going, Philip, this is who I am. Like, take it or leave it, but this is who I am. This, I, and I can't be anybody else. Why are we, why can't we get there? Why are we so afraid? Well, I think we are getting there and I think we're going to get there so much more. I think one of the challenges is that we're living so much in our heads and, and we're, we're intellectually moving through this world, you know, living from here, yeah. from here up, not from here down. Uh, quite frankly, we don't even need to pull these bodies around. If we had two little legs hanging out of the bottom of our heads, we'd save a <laughs> shitload of energy, a shitload of time. We wouldn't need to eat as much food just to fill it up. We wouldn't need a lot of clothing, black clothes or otherwise. But just, just going back to one point is something I've never talked about before is how many people have you heard of, known of, spoken of, um, spoken about, um, et cetera, that have had a massive emotional breakthrough with somebody they love as that person passes away, often we hear about this in the context of parents, that they, 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 they come into this world so vulnerable and, 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 and so in need of support and they leave the world in the same thing. And often there's just little window, this little gap of this complete shedding and letting go of all the masks, mm. all the expectations and allowing the world to see them for who they are in that moment. Mm. But we spend the, the middle 50, 60 or 70 years trying to pretend we're something else. Mm. Um, Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, whether it's through the media, through our, our own insecurities, I think it's down to the age of like seven, eight, nine years old. At the playground, we pick up these masks. Yeah. And the reason we're picking up the mask, putting them on, is not because we want to stand out, it's because we desperately want to fit in. Right. The, the tall, beautiful, young teenager, uh, female, often, not always, mm -hmm. is the one who kind of cowers and, and, and bends over because they don't want to stand out. They want to fit in. They don't want to be tall and walking one foot above everybody else. Mm. So we desperately want to fit in because it's, it, it's just this innate need. And what we don't realize is by being who we are, yes, we may think we stand out, but what we do is we fit in in our own skins, in our own souls, in our own hearts. And what ends up doing is we pull people with us and give them permission to know that it's okay to be yourself, right. warts and all. And we desperately need to be seen and we desperately need to be heard and we desperately need to be belong. Mm. And yet the very thing we do is the opposite yeah and uh, humans are good at that yeah and and and, and you know it's funny because the more you do that the more the people go thank you for giving me the, the permission that i've been waiting for to speak a bit more my truth right and and this leads me to actually to the to, to another topic that you know give the one last talk of your life and the event that you started organizing called one last talk um which i'll have the the for people in vancouver i believe it's in november something around the 5th of the 6th of november there's the next event so people can buy tickets online I'll, I'll put all this in the show notes so tell me a bit i love the concept by the way but just tell me a bit more about how you came about the idea of doing this project of help giving people an opportunity to to tell their stories yeah, I, I, I thank you. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I feel the emotion comes through my body right now, not because it's a product or a concept I created, sure. it's why I created yeah. it. And the reason I created it was very simple. Um, number one is the sadness that I have as I travel this world and see people who just do not believe in themselves. They'll believe in a god, they'll believe in a football player, they'll believe in an iconic business character, they'll believe in a celebrity like that. They'll almost want to be them. And I was one of those. So I think there's a sadness that actually relates you to me personally. Be? Uh, any fucking anybody, <laughs> yeah. anybody. Yeah. That's how uncomfortable I was in my yeah. own skin. I wanted to be anybody but me. Mm. And when I think about that, all I want to do is cry because I think it's so tragic that a young man who has so much potential, I'm talking about myself here, which I've never, like this, I've never spoken about myself, but so tragic to think about I'm walking this earth and all I wanted to be was anybody but me. And then as I came across very iconic characters, then I latched my belief onto them and I put them on a pedestal unfairly and, and ridiculously in many respects. And now I realize finally in my later, you know, I'm 43 now and I'm loving figuring out more and more and more who I am. But just going back to one last talk, I created it because I believe that there is no greater story in the world than the one we've lived. Now, people don't have to agree with that, and that's part of the challenge. People said to me, unless you've got celebrities and big-name speakers, it's not going to work. And I said, you're wrong. The world needs people telling real stories, ordinary people telling extraordinary stories, and the relatability was something. So let's just – I use Richard Branson as an example. A great guy, he's done great things in the world. So it's not to take away from him. But if I'm sitting in an audience and Richard Branson is speaking, and I've shared the stage with him a number of times – 
and he's speaking. I'm not saying he can't add value. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this. At some level, people are subconsciously discounting themselves yeah. saying, He's different. Ah, it's come Richard on. Branson. It's that guy. Yeah. Yes, I see that all the time. He's an island. Yeah, so yeah, 85,000 yeah. staff. Come on. So what I wanted to do is take that away as well and put 80% of the speakers at one last talk have never spoken on a stage before. Mm. So what I do this weekend, it's actually the event's going to be in Toronto in November. I'm flying into oh, Toronto, Toronto this Toronto, weekend. Toronto, yeah taking the speakers on a retreat and helping them dig really deep and creating and extracting the greatest story mm. they have, whether they believe it or not, mm. to do nothing other than to serve an audience. And here's what happens. When they get off that stage, in their own way, they say the same thing. Mm. I cannot believe my story matters. matters. Yeah. Because they're not talking about a widget. If, if their skill set is winemaking, for example, I know that you, you keep drinking wine in front of me. It's very irritating. Uh, I'm joking. Um, they've been used to speaking about wine. I don't give a shit about wine. I want to yeah. hear their story, not about global warming, but about them. And it, it really is definitely, and I can say it with a lot of degree of authority because it's not about me i create the environment i help them extract the store but it's all about the speaker but yeah and, and isn't that interesting right so this is something that i thought was was quite interesting so you so you're saying on one side like yeah that your story is what matters the most right it's like your story is like the most important story because you're the one that can tell it and there's also this side of like and it's not about you so so tell 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 the audience a bit more about that so they can understand what you mean by like it's at the same time all about you and it has nothing to do with you yeah, it's it's uh, and this is the thing that excites me the most is that you know people come to the speaker retreat and the, and and their talk is designed to make them look good. The desire and not even look good, but well, like the desire. Like I, I, I want to make sure that I get on stage and that people go standing ovation because you know, boom, that's my outcome that I'm focusing on rather than the experience that I'm sharing. Yeah, or even just yeah. get on and get the job done and get off and feel safe. Yeah. Forget about this standing <laughs> ovation. And I'm saying, guys, if there's one invitation in the context of one last mm. talk, is to not make this talk about you. You've got to remember that whether you believe this or not, there might be one person in the audience that has faced depression, faced suicide, faced uh, physical, mental, or sexual abuse. And what your story, your courage is going to do is just, if nothing else, let them know that they're not alone, hmm. that they're not messed up, that they have nothing to be ashamed of, and that there's hope. In fact, one of the coolest speeches ever in one last talk was a guy I asked, and I, I love this guy, and it's all about the people. And he goes, Philip, but... My life's in shit. And I said, well, that's your perspective because we're great at self-judging ourselves. I think you're evolving and it's not great, but you're doing something about it. It's not the guy it. that went to prison, I, was it? What's that? It wasn't the guy that went to prison. I listened to a couple of the talks. No, this is, yeah. a, this is a different guy. Okay. He gets up and do you know the name of his talk? No. Everything is awesome, not. <laughs> and do you know what was so amazing about that? And he trusted me to bring him through this yeah. journey, to put him on a stage, to put him in front of people. And I protect them like you wouldn't believe mm. um, to, to keep them safe and to make sure that their message is, 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 is respected. Sure. People in the audience loved it because finally there's a speaker yeah. that's prepared to get on a stage and not have it all figured out. Yeah. And so, so it reminds me a bit of the moth. I don't know if you know of the moth, but they do a similar format. I've take, heard of it. Yeah. yeah. They, they take, they take basically it started in like underground bars in New York. I think I may be getting this wrong, but it started off with people who've never spoken before and they get, they have a topic and then they get coached. Um, so, so much is going through my mind right now. The first one is... And by, by the way, I'm going to throw something out there and I'm just feeling yeah. this right now. Yeah. And I've done, been very fortunate to a number of podcasts recently and I've never said this. And I'm actually, my heart is starting to beat right now. But I want, my vision for one last talk is it's not about me, that I, I let it go and I share it with the world and give it away. And I want, my vision is that eventually we have chapters in cities around the world where they meet once a month. You get three speakers who get up and share yeah. their truth with a framework and we help them. And that is the vision. And, 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 and it scares the shit out of me because I don't know how I'm going to yeah. do it. But I've decided today, just now, it, it wasn't planned, is I'm going to just throw it out there and just say, this is what I want to do. I want to have yeah. this around the world because this is not something I should hold on to and control because it's bigger than me. It's way more important than Philip McKernan. Yeah, well, thank you. You've heard it, you've heard it here first, folks. And by the way, if you listen to a previous episode now that you've been on this show, I do every week um, the top 10 countries in the world that are listening to this show. And we're, we're literally around the world. So whoever's listening to this, know that Philip is giving you permission at certain some stage, and you might have to see this with Philip directly on, on Twitter, I don't know. Uh, but to start your own chapter of of the one last talk, um, 
Yeah. So that that's beautiful. Here's here's a question for you. Two things. One, if someone hasn't been through depression, hasn't lost someone, hasn't been sexually abused, hasn't gone through like some epic tragedy, do you think they still have a story to tell? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah. Tell me. In more fact, about that. their story, with respect, is the ones that need to be heard most of all because it's it's seemed right or wrong in society that the tragic stories, the very publicly tragic mm. stories. Uh, the ones that society rank as the most tragic are the ones that are heard or read about or are shared. I, I, I don't believe they're the most tragic. I sat in a school most of my life with dyslexia, being misunderstood, looking at the ground, counting dandruff on the, on, on the shoulders of the kid in front of me because I needed to keep myself sane. All these very embarrassing things. Yeah. And w that was my kind of abuse. I was abused by teachers. I was abused by yeah. emotionally in different ways. There is no story in this world that's more tragic than anybody else or more tragic. And if someone tells you, Jesus, I, well, I, 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 I like the idea of this concept, but I, I mean, I had an amazing childhood. Like there's nothing I could speak about that has any kind of degree of, of, of pain and or whatever. Mm. Well, number one is they're full of shit because they haven't done a deep enough dive in their story sure. to find out that actually they were in pain and they were disconnected. They were emotionally starved at some level. And secondly is it's not just about bad stories. It's not yeah. just about sadness. But sometimes the greatest growth is in the shit. It's in that darkness. But one guy stood up on stage last year and, and just said, I'm going to share my one last talk as if I'm just speaking to my three little girls. Mm. And he shares this story. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, I just, it, it, it runs so deep. And he shares this story about his three, just his talk to his three girls. And it was so beautiful and so relatable to everybody. And he said to me afterwards that if I walked out of this hotel today, and got hit by, hit by a bus, I'd have no regrets. Mm. What moves you about that? How's that? What moves you about that? Is, is providing a space of safety and belief that this man is gifted beyond, mm. so far beyond what he can fathom, mm. and that he has the capability, not just intellectually, but emotionally, to get on a stage, open people's minds, and open and stir their hearts. And he didn't know that going in, but he trusted me. And that is a very sacred place. When people give me that trust, it's like, I never imagined that would happen in my life. I never asked for it. I never expected it. Mm. Um, and, and, and to see him blossom and to open up that way was, is, it's, there's no dollar bill that can ever, ever. And people keep saying to me, so how much do the speakers uh, pay to be on the on the on the stage because they think that's the business model that the speakers so if believe it or not yeah and, i know, and this I know. Might surprise I've, actually, I've actually been approached by people like hey yeah do you want to do you want to come and speak my show but his, you got to come on the talking coaching course and then you get to speak on stage you got to pay like six grand or whatever it was totally so, yeah. i mean that's the model that most people think we do i don't charge anything i'm flying to toronto this week to spend three i should give or take travel three or four days of my life yeah. not because i i'm getting paid because i want to extract the best story and when all is said and done, I'm not even sure one last talk makes money, but it's not about <laughs> yeah. fucking money with this. It's yeah. about the message. Well, I'm smiling because the unconventionalist started because of that, because I believe that everybody had a story to share. And it didn't matter if you were had four billion readers like I've had, like the, the founders of uh, The Minimalists, or if you're a guy that no one's ever heard of, but you have a story that's that matters and you have a story that's worth being shared. So thank you for... for um, for confirming that and the other thing is that i'm also dyslexic and i also grew up in an environment where teachers would publicly take my uh, score sheets in front of everyone and make fun of it because it had so many uh, red crosses that call it the cemetery and so i grew up with that um and there's something that i just want to sort of uh, interlink back to what we were talking about one of the reasons why i wanted to get you so much on the show is that i'm so tired of seeing people in in i want to say our industry in terms of the sort of the public development, the human emotion, the falling in love with yourself, the whatever you want to call it. Full of shit is what the, the, the sort of really, I can't think of anything more polite to say in terms of putting on this facade of everything's great and everything's amazing and look at my life. I've got six Ferraris in my back garden and I'm doing this six-figure course in six days and all this stuff. Do you think there is hope that there's a place for people like you and I to just show up vulnerably and just go, we we also have problems. I mean, we're, we're not perfect. And, and yeah, I don't know if that's even a question. I'm kind of rambling on here. Well, I'm speak like, for yourself. My life is completely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, my have, clients have, have you noticed some... this? Or is it, I mean, is it just... Do, do, I mean, do you... It is. It is. It is staggering. And coming from me, a lot of people would say it's just judgment, and I'm bitter, and because I'm not a big enough speaker, or whatever other judgments or realities. Ninety-eight percent of the speakers that I meet who stand on a stage and tell you how to live your life, mm. or say how they live their life, get off stage and are somebody completely different. Yeah. And you would be well, maybe not you, based on the comments you just made. People would be absolutely speechless. If I shared the names, which I'll never will yeah, yeah, ever, and it's because it's not my place. Yeah, yeah. But what I would encourage people to do is trust their own intuition. Mm. I've literally had people come up to me at events who have ignored their intuition, thrown their credit card at a speaker to spend you know ten or fifteen grand on their training, knowing deep down that this person is not in alignment with who they are, and to subsequently find out that actually the training, either one didn't work, two brought them on an avenue and a path that, that didn't really serve them, or three is it just didn't land right afterwards. And what they did was, the mistake they made was, and I don't blame the speaker, I have to, the people, the individuals have to take responsibility, is they didn't trust their intuition. If you just stop, think about how many mistakes you've made in a relationship context. I had a lady one day who said to me, I am so devastated. I've just been torn apart. My heart's been ripped out of my body from this guy. He's devastated. He's messed my life. It's so hard to get my shit back together again. And much to her frustration, not straight away, you know, over a period of time, I said, I need you to go back to the beginning. Mm. Did you see this coming? And you can imagine her anger. Like she just said, no, don't you dare think that. You, you, don't you try and blame me. I said, I'm not blaming anybody. Did you see this coming? And as the anger subsides, the truth emerges. Mm. And the truth was, as she walked down the aisle, she had a question mark. Mm. The day she met him, she had a question mark. Mm. But she ignored it. And think about this in a business context, in a financial context. Oh, God, yeah. this, this is life. Yeah. She ignored it because she desperately wanted a relationship. Yeah. And logically, she had achieved the goal and the outcome that she desired, which was getting married, finding the greatest guy ever. And then what she does is she pushes and suppresses the, the, the feeling piece away yeah. which is the indicator the little internal soul compass going you know beep 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 yeah. warning signs yeah. here and she didn't address it but you know what's amazing about that is that um so i'm currently you know leading this um, facilitating this group of 38 people trying to find more meaningful work from 25 to 45 and we meet once a week and one thing i was speaking about last yesterday we were talking about identity and how we peg ourselves to identity and i forgot someone said how do you know when it's the right decision to make or not and I started basically telling them that around intuition and your gut feeling. And in the Western society, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, I feel like especially in the corporate world, there is no room for gut feeling, intuition, and what we feel in our, in our, in our sort of guts, you know? And the more we get disconnected from that, be it through mobile phones, be it through, again, sex, alcohol, food, or whatever you have you, we derive into wrong decisions. But what you're saying is that we know that that's happening. And yet we still do it. I think when I say we know, I mean, yeah. it's only when we slow down and create the space. Because okay. two of us, so many of us are so busy. We're so yeah. busy doing shit that we, we, we don't even have the time to stop to even consider whether we knew it or not it. at the beginning. Yeah. But, in, but, but if you slow someone down and you say, so for example, I had a client reach out to me recently and it was a very dis large decision they needed to make financially. And I said, well, where, where are you leaning? Absolutely, yes. So, well, why are we having this phone call? Well, I just want to make sure. Now, they're not looking for my permission because my clients don't ask, get my permission. Sure. They're not looking for me to answer it for them because I won't do that either. My work is all about drawing it out mm. from you, uncovering it from within you, which is a little bit more, you need to be a little bit more patient and trust the process a bit more. But trust me, when you own it, it's you. It's not me. It's not, you don't need Philip McKern in your life sure. anymore. Um, and, I, and I just said, okay, so let's just let go of this decision for a second. Let's just check in and see how you're doing. And we've done some wonderful work together in simplifying this person's life, in aligning them to work that has meaning, helping them build a beautiful relationship that didn't previously exist within the context of their own skin and therefore the people around them that they thought were 10 out of 10s in relationships. Mm. But in actual fact, they now subsequently find out they were probably only fives and now they're at eights and they cannot fucking believe how good they are. <laughs> now, it's not all perfect, by the way. I'm not trying to paint this picture of perfection because sure. that's a lie as well. But it's, it's really good. And I said, so, okay, anyway, back to this decision. And this person just goes, this is just a silly decision. <laughs> this, like, if I do this, this is just going to go back to chaos, back yeah. to busyness. And while it intellectually makes sense, I get it, yeah. based on who I am, 
it's out of alignment. Yeah. So this 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 is this brings on to the next topic that I wanted to cover with you, which was around. I hear you speak a lot around the differentiating between what we want and what we think we want. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you tell a bit more about that around people listening to this and going, how do I know if this is what I really want to do or if this is what I've been telling myself I want to do, what other people have been telling me and I've actually bought that on me? Okay, so let me ask your audience a question. We're not going to get live feedback here, obviously, <laughs> but is is if you're listening to this or watching this, um, is this going to be played on video yeah, or yeah, just audio? You, yeah, on YouTube and, and iTunes. and yes, There's so YouTube as well. So you can, you, you're can going to basically publicly tease me by your with your glass of wine. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, I'll let it go. I promise I will let it go eventually. <laughs> when you come to um, London, I promise I'll buy you a, a glass of wine. You'll come over and we'll, uh, we'll have a chat. Done. Yeah. Sold. I, I'm in. Um, I would ask the audience just to stop for just a second and answer as honestly as you can. How much of your life do you spend living in your head? And I mean daily, like just not every moment of every day. So sometimes you might feel you're living less in your head and more in your head and everything else. And how much time do you spend living in your head? And the more, so, so, so if a guy in particular says seven and a half, let's just say someone's driving the car, watching this at home, they go seven and a half. And as a guy, I would take off the half and remove two. So it's five. Okay. And I, and I, pro I started, that started as a joke yeah. and it's now turned out to be this equation. incredibly <laughs> accurate equation. Like it's extremely staggering how many people I've done this to in live audiences yeah. 3,000 people at one time and, and one guy said that he goes well actually five was the first number I was going to put down yeah. so be really as ruthlessly honest as you can be with that question uh, how much time do you spend living in your head if if it's an eight or a nine which it, for many people it's a, it, it is an eight or a nine and just because you do yoga and meditation and all that doesn't mean that you, you don't live in your head, okay? That, that does not equal, meditation does not equal not living in your head. That, that's not my experience. Anyway, if you're an 8 out of 10, for example, which a lot of people are in society today, then that is a reflection that everything that you want, everything that you feel that you, you think you want is coming from that place. Mm. So a lot of, of what you want, then you could arguably say, just to simplify it, 80% of what you want, you think you want, mm. but it doesn't necessarily align to who you are. So another way of describing this is saying, are you somebody that no matter what you achieve, when you get to the summit of that mountain, you get there, you have an expectation and an assumption that you'll feel something. You don't know what it is, but you'll feel more content, you'll feel happy or more successful. But you stand on that summit and go, shit, I thought it was going to be better. Yeah. I thought it was going to be different. But what we do then is we don't stop to say, okay, why does this pattern exist? Yeah. What, am, what do I need to look at that I haven't seen? What we do is we replace the summit with the next summit. We go, next thing, ah, yeah. That was, yeah, look was across the, the valley. Yeah. I chased the wrong thing. Yeah. When I get to the top of that mountain, yeah. then I'll be happy. But the valley in between... Mm. Okay, represents three, four, five years of people's lives. Yeah. That's the thing that I want to shorten or eliminate. I want to make sure the shit that we're doing is in alignment with who we are. Somebody said to me recently, I want you to work with me and coach me. And I said, great. I said, I want to grow my business. Brilliant. Why are you in your business? Well, well, well because, it, uh, because I love it. And I go, well, great. Well, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, maybe you do. Let's get to the core. Mm. Yeah. I want to help you grow a business that's in alignment. I won't help you grow a piece of shit if it doesn't align to who you are because all I'm doing is aiding and sending you down the wrong path and I'm accelerating that process for you and that's not my work. Yeah, and I just want to reflect what you're saying, which is basically um, we make up that we will feel different once we've reached something that we've pegged our sense of happiness or well-being to an external factor. So when yes. I get that promotion, when I get that girl, that boy, when I get that car, when I get that public speaking gig, when I make that six figure, I will feel different. When in fact, what you're saying is that has nothing to do with it. It's not the goal. It's right now. It's who you are. It's how you feel about yourself. Which brings me to, you said this a few times, and I know originally you were like, I'm going to keep this quiet. And then you've been talking about me more. But is it 2025? You want to become the president of Ireland? Is that, is that did I get yes. the right date right? Yeah. Yes. Um, Tell me how does that link to what we just talked about, about the sort of the, here's the goal that I'm setting myself and yet I don't make up that I'll feel different when I get there. Yeah, I don't feel, I don't know if I will feel different and I'm not attached to that. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's an intention as opposed to a goal and I think they're right. a little bit different. So 
One is about being, I brought a group of coaching clients. Um, I got the, a great opportunity to bring them in, not just to a guy who's seemed iconic in, in the world of leadership, but he's actually a really cool guy. And I brought this small group into a guy called James Curley, who's the global president of Levi Strauss and all their different respective brands. And he's reinventing the, the brand from the inside out, literally. Um, and he said that we, I want, I want to, uh, I want Levi's to be the 150 year old startup. I want to, I want to know that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us, like most of the culture does. He said, I want the brand to be inspirational and aspirational. And he explained the context around that. And I was beautifully articulated and felt by at least him. And, you know, it really got me. And, and by the way, the, the presidency thing I announced seven, eight years ago, people think, yeah. oh, what a great marketing thing for YouTube uh, hits or whatever. I don't understand that shit. But, it was, you know, yeah. coming to out, launch like this. Like Philip McKinnon coming out or something like that. Correct. Many, yeah. many years ago, as opposed to putting it out because, you know, Trump is doing it and piggybacking <laughs> over. I, I said this eight, nine years ago. But I do want my life to be inspirational. Uh, I can't. I, I'm not here to decide whether it is or it is. I hope it is. And I also want it to be aspirational. But here's the big thing about the the intention about being present. I'm very clear on why I want to be president of Ireland, mm -hmm. but I'm not attached to it. I don't need it. Yeah. And I want it like my wife, but I don't need it. Mm. So I'm not here planning. Like I don't have a system. I don't have a strategy. I don't have a roadmap, any of that shit. Yeah, it's that but by, way. by having it there, I think, I hope it does two things. Number one is it tells the world, you know, what my intention is. Number two is, is real purpose mm. is to inspire people to dream. And not just to dream big, I, you know, this thing of just dream big, think big, you can dream as big as you want, but if you don't believe in yourself, it's not going to make a difference. Yeah. Okay. So, but just to believe that you can be a better version of who you are, that's the purpose of that. So if it gets one person to set an intention of who they want to be, what they want to do, yeah. that's in alignment with who they are. I've won all day long. Yeah, I don't know if there's the same expression in in, um, in English, but in French, there's an expression that says "aim for the moon." If you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. And and I think it's it reminds me that it's like you know even if whether I become or not the person that's be that you know that's beside the point. The fact that I put that intention out there, you know, I may inspire someone out there to hey, yeah, what if I became, you know, president of my own company, whatever it was, or. Um, so I love that yeah. the um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and there's a few topics I wanted to cover and we, we're not we won't have time to cover them well that's okay because we'll be running a chapter uh, of one last um, talk here in in London soon I'm sure uh, I want to talk about believe in youth which which I thought was um, an amazing like like sort of a human story and a, and a heart story was was very moving um, and you and you had a fundraising campaign and correct me if I'm wrong I, I just thought I'd um, share what I learned, which basically it sounded like there were 20 to 25 girls who were sex slaves in a mining, um, in, was it Peru, I believe? And then they, Peru, they, yes. yeah, Peru, and then, and then the police came, stopped the whole ordeal and then ended up putting the girls in jails and you decided to do something about it. And mm. you successfully fundraised over, I think it was a hundred and I don't know how many percent, but basically you raised $70,450. Yeah. I, I, I'd yeah. love to hear you know, did you ever think that you'd pull it off or um, what were you surprised about this campaign? Um, and also where, where, where are you guys at on, on that whole process? Yeah, I mean, I didn't want, part of me didn't want to hear the story, but when the story, when I started to hear about the story, I knew what it was going to do to me and I knew it was going to take me off on this on this, on this this journey. And, and, and I say I didn't want to hear the story. There's sometimes, you know, there's a there's some it's just a part of me very selfish just didn't kind of want to hear it's like oh no no you can't hear it i didn't hear it didn't hear it but i couldn't it just penetrated me and just got into my soul and and the fact is that the kids are are were, were abused they were were abducted and put in a horrific environment and um, but continue to get punished for something that they didn't do so the peruvian government don't have a, pl a safe place to put them so they don't have the room and an orphanage or anything else so they put them in this in this prison it's basically it's a prison right so the the conditions are horrendous so these girls have now been abused sexually for months and months and months on end we can't even imagine what they've gone mm -hmm. through um, and now they're taken out of this situation they're put in a prison and you can imagine that at some level they're going well, well why am i like why am i stuck in this room in this in this shithole based on you know so the so it's just further validating that they're they're worth nothing so um we've we've seek permission from the peruvian government that if we build them a safe environment a safe haven <clears throat> they will allow us to give them a home and um 
Yeah, so that's what we're doing. So we needed to raise some money. We put it out there and we raised uh, enough, not just to build the, the complex, but to build a wall around it to keep them safe. Um, and I think what surprised me about this is that just the generosity from people who've never even met me. I had literally a guy give us $10,000 and he has never even met me. So that comes with this overwhelming expectation and pressure on me because you've got other people's money. You've got these girls we're trying to do something about and now we've got to go and do it. And we're, we've broken ground. The walls are being built. I literally got a uh, two photographs yesterday. Um, so this will be done no matter what. Like I am, uh, uh, like ridiculously focused and determined. I'm going down next month. I'm bringing a group down. We're doing a retreat down there and we're going to go and visit the location. Um, so yeah, what surprised me is, is people's, is people's generosity without even knowing me is just yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. And, and I just want to acknowledge you and, and thank you for, um, giving yourself the space to feel that emotion that you just went mm. through. Cause I know that you know, it can be easy to, and it's difficult, you know, this is, this is an awkward environment to sort of sometimes show these kind of emotions, but thank you for being real, you know, really, genuinely. Um, and I just want to, well, I didn't expect you to, I didn't, ex I, you've obviously done your research because I purposely didn't, you know, ask you for questions in advance. I didn't know where we were going to yeah. go today and you've yeah, obviously done your digging because you, yeah, you know. I don't, I mean, I don't actually, it's funny. I, I've never actually sent any questions in advance. I don't believe in that. Um, I, I kind of read about people, the people that generally kind of um, move me or interest me. And then I kind of flow through the conversation and just see where it goes and, and hopefully cover the things. But yeah, I just, I mean, uh, yeah, just an amazing project. I mean, reading about it was just like, wow. So, you know, congratulations. And I, know, and I love how you, you're honest about the fact that you just didn't want, you don't want to be having to deal with it, you know, like, because we all have that side of us that says we walk in front of people, homeless people every day and we don't want to make eye contact because it's awkward. And they're just sitting there and you've got a pound in your pocket and they're asking for money and you make, you avoid eye contact. And if you they, if they happen to cross your eyesight because your iPhone was too low at that moment where you walked by and you go, I'm sorry, no, I don't have any cash on me. Sorry, mate. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I get that. The, um, the, the One of the last things I want to talk about before we, we wrap up the interview was you have a documentary coming out. Um, and I don't know if it's already out or if it's coming out at the end of the year. I mean, what la latest I saw in the trailer was the end of 2016. Uh, Give and Grow. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit more about about that and what this documentary means to you. Yeah, I mean, Giving Grow started in Sri Lanka many years ago, just after the tsunami, where I got exposed to giving in a very different way, and I think it did two things: it shifted my perspective in terms of my value in this earth, and it it also um, just allowed me to question what I did for the first time because it gave me perspective in the context of my own life. And while there's a lot of volunteer experiences out in the world, and there's a lot of places where you can volunteer. Um, I've really done a deep dive in this and I've realized that the one thing that's missing in the volunteer world, and it's not a, it's not a criticism. I, I'm not saying don't go on a volunteer experience yeah. whether it's overseas or in dom domestically. Please do it. Absolutely do it. Um, and missing maybe is the wrong term, but maybe what could be added in is just the why. So in other words, what I do is, is uh, for example, we're going to Peru next uh, in two months time. I'm going to bring a group down, uh, primarily business owners. It doesn't, it's not about you have to be business sure. or that's not the point. And we work with, um, you know, orphans or street kids or vulnerable, uh, you know, young, young people. And we do that for three or four days. And then what we do is we go out into nature and we go hiking. And it's just to create the space mm. to allow everything Slowing we've down. gone through to land mm. emotionally, not just intellectually. Yeah. And then we go into this workshop. We do, we do a deep dive on, okay, what happened to you? Yeah. What came up for you? Mm. What stirred you? What ha like, wh where does this relate to you in the context of your life? Where does giving show up? What about your gift? And that's the big drive for me recently is this gift yeah. versus talent. And um, so anyway, where I was doing one of these give and grow retreats, I brought a, 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 a videographer and a group with me or a, a team with me to, to, to video and sound everything else. And I said, okay, not to promote, this is not to promote retreats. This is to remind people of an old message that when we give unconditionally, we grow exponentially. Mm. And we followed people before, during and after India last year. And some of the shifts are subtle and significant. But ultimately, what ends up happening is people's truth emerged, their gift emerged. Mm. And then when they went back to their respective lives, they couldn't lie anymore. Mm. They had to make changes to be more in alignment and honor who they are. And we have this documented and this and this on this documentary called Give and Grow. I believe it's it's important. Um 
we poured a lot into it. Mm. And it's, it's, it's not to promote our core business, it's to promote a message that you have value. And, it, and while sometimes we need to cut a check for this orphanage, for example, what I want people to do is to give of themselves and to see how that can change you mm. in terms of your value and how, how much you've got to offer this world, whether it's through your story or just through your soul or whatever it happens to be. So we are excited and quite frankly, I'm nervous about it. I mean, you put something out there with your name on it, you know, you're, sure. you're I'm nervous about yeah, it, but yeah. I, it doesn't, it's not going to stop me. Yeah. And I just want to, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the main things that you kind of bang on about with this process is that it's not about bringing pens or bringing toys or giving out cash. It's giving your time, nothing else, just you yeah. being present, playing with a kid, yeah. uh, volunteering with, you know, people who need your time. So it's not about what you need it's about who you are in that process yeah yeah, yeah. And that, i remember that, one lady saying but i don't speak spanish and i said great <laughs> and she had a phrase book and i said put that thing away or i'll burn it and she goes well, what do you mean and then she just had to connect yeah and what the what the phrase book was maybe a genuine desire to speak their language sure. but it was a d way of distracting yeah so people feel really uncomfortable one lady yeah. said to me i'd love to go on one of those give and grow retreats but what about the day you leave the kids and i'm kind of this is all about you. <laughs> how will I feel? But they might. Yeah, how will I feel? About but, they, but they, I'm sure they'll be sad as well. I said, but you're saying I'm sure, but you have no idea. Yeah. She comes and she yeah. goes, oh my God, it was the opposite. Yeah, yeah. The joy. Mm -hmm. And when I'm leaving, do I want to leave? Not necessarily, but I've never felt, she said, I've never felt so full in my life. Not full of information. Full as in joy in her life. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it's probably one of the, one of the most, rewarding things that I've, I've had a, had a chance. So I, I create experiences that I believe people need yeah. less on the market, you know, whether the market wants it or, or can absorb it or whatever. I don't, I don't make decisions based on economics. I yeah. don't, I take it into consideration after the fact, but not before. Yeah. So Philip, we're coming to the end of the interview. I've got a few questions that I ask every guest. Um, before I do that, I just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge you and for being a beaming light of, honesty and genuinity and of course you haven't got it all together and of course you're fucked up in so many different ways like all of us but i think the way that you show up uh, over and over again and that you point things that are so uncomfortable for us to to look at and actually go i need to look at you in the face be it that fear be it that um shame guilt whatever it is and to enable people to see that their story is a gift and that they matter and that they have a gift to share with the world no matter who they are so i just want to say thank you for that because it's needed I appreciate uh, and I really hope that a lot of people can can connect with you um what does being unconventional mean to you unconventional is I I shared something the other day is I, I feel I'm a, a human disruptor uh, I'm, I'm I'm not out there trying to be but I think that's what's happening I'm disrupting the conversations and um, so being unconventional is is disrupting the conversation with a purpose. Um, being unconventional to me is not following the masses. Being unconventional to me, sadly, is being getting to know who I am at the deepest level possible and allowing that to show up every day. That shouldn't be unconventional, mm. um, but it is, mm. unfortunately, in this world. And, and, and by doing it myself, I hope I give people not just permission, but the sacred space to do that themselves and know and to believe that it's not just okay, but it's needed beyond belief. Yeah. Love that. Uh, what's one thing most people don't know about you? Most people don't know that I don't have my shit figured out. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, even though you kindly pointed it out as you sip your glass of red wine, <laughs> which I don't have. The other thing is I can't let things guy. go. <laughs> um, what do they not know about me? Uh, I mean, I can give you the kind of the funny stuff and the and and, and all the other stuff. Um, I I. Well, what's one thing that's uncomfortable yeah, I, for you to share? What's that? What's one thing that may be uncomfortable for you to share? Or maybe something that's quite funny that no one knows that you like, I'm a violinist or I was a flute Olympian. Well, I'm a kind of a closet poet. Uh, I write poetry, which I don't share. Um, I basically represented, you know, Australia in, in an international winemaking competition, uh, you know, with a caddy. <laughs> I almost was killed by an elephant, closest I've ever come to death. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I've faced my own mortality in a way, which yeah. actually is not a joke. Like I literally was almost killed by an elephant in Nigeria. Nigeria many years yeah. ago. Was that? Was that Nigeria? In Nigeria, yeah, yeah. and I think that's something that most people don't know about me, but it's something that actually, in hindsight, I would never wish on myself again or anybody else. But I think by facing my own mortality, I think I give less a shit about taking risks to some extent. Um, but I think they're the, they're the kind of the funny things and whatever. Maybe that's enough, but I think that the big thing is to know that 
every time I get on a stage, I want to puke. I wake up some days and I doubt the shit out of what I do and my ability and whether I'm on this planet in the right, you know, I doubt what I do, Mm. but it doesn't stop me because my inspiration, my fuel Mm. is not Red Bull, it's people. And I think sometimes people, you started the interview by saying people like that don't suffer from this. People like that have the gift of the gab, people like that, whatever. And while that might be the perception, the truth is I'm so much happier than I've ever been and I have a mission in this earth. But I don't have it all figured out, and nor will I ever have it all figured out. And I don't wait till I have it all figured out before I pull trigger. In the absence of clarity, take action. Yeah. That's what I do, and I'm very good at it. Brilliant. Last question. Uh, if all your talks were erased, all your blog posts disappeared, your books were off Amazon bookshelves, um, and today was your last day, and you could leave behind three truths that you believe are truer than true, what would those three truths be? I give you one. We give ourselves what we feel we deserve. You can blame the government. You can blame Donald Trump. You can blame your boss. You can blame corporate America. You can blame um, global warming. But look in the mirror and take responsibility for the life that you inhabit. Don't blame yourself. That's very, very different. But we give ourselves what we feel we deserve. So you can do two things with that. You can go ahead and change your life aesthetically and intellectually. And think that it's all going to work out, but it's not because the same pattern is going to arrive. And the reason the same pattern is going to arrive is because you haven't dealt with the core issue. And that is probably because you don't believe in yourself. Your self-value needs to be worked on. And who you are at the core is the most underrated conversational, explorational and work that we will ever do. If you shift your value in who you are as a person, everything around you will change. Everything around you will change. Um, so it, I know you've asked for three, but I want to give one in the app, in, Philip, it, you'll it, be it, the it, first case in my 40 episodes that will not go to the three. <laughs> you cannot do this to me. This is I, I can do. because I'm just being unconventional, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we give ourselves what we feel we deserve. So I encourage and implore people to do a deeper dive and work on their self-worth. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you like who you are. Mm-hmm. So you might be the best widget violinator player, winemaker, podcast host in the world, and you think that's self-worth, that's confidence, that's not self-worth. So work on your value and everything else changes around you. Philip, thank you so much. I, I will say it here, I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know where, but you and I will get to do some great work together and I look forward to it. Likewise, thank you. Thanks. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed today's interview as much as I did. I was really moved, actually, that Philip allowed himself to be vulnerable in that way and he actually told me that this was one of the most emotional interviews he's ever given on a podcast. If you'd like to find out more, make sure to go and check out Philip McKernan's website and if you're in Toronto on the 5th and 6th of November, One Last Talk is happening. You can go and get the tickets on onelasttalk.com. As always, I'm so appreciative of your time spending listening to a story or a message that I'm sharing with you. If you'd like to subscribe to this channel, that'd be amazing. And if you want to share this video with someone you know who could use some of Philip McKernan's tips and insights, please go ahead and do so. And until next time, you know what time it is. It's time to take action.